Hi everyone, this lesson is on essential tremors. So essential tremors are going to be a movement disorder involving a tremor of a part of the body. We'll discuss what parts of the body are more likely to be affected by essential tremor later on in this lesson. Now a tremor is going to be defined as an involuntary, rhythmic, oscillatory movement of a body part. This definition comes from the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society. Now, there are many different types of tremors. There are physiologic tremors, which are going to occur in healthy individuals. So these are going to be normal tremors that can occur from either too much caffeine or stress. We can also see tremors occurring in intention tremors, and we can also see tremors in Parkinson's disease. Now, a central tremor is going to have particular characteristics, which will set it apart from other types of tremor, and we'll discuss those characteristics later on in this lesson. Now, a central tremor is going to be the most common movement disorder. It's going to be the most common cause of tremor, and it is a relatively common condition. It's estimated to affect up to 1 to 5% of the general population. So some estimates will put it at closer to 1%. Some estimates will be closer to 5%. Most of the time, we're going to see estimates around 1% of the general population worldwide. And prevalence of a central tremor increases with increasing age. So as individuals get older, they're more likely to have a central tremor. So a lot of these higher numbers in some of the estimates are likely related to older aged populations or older individuals. And again, as patients get older, especially after the age of 60 and older than that, their chances of getting a central tremor increases. So the prevalence again increases, especially after the age of 60. Now, the underlying etiology or the cause of this condition is not known. It is known, though, that there is a familial connection, so there's likely genetic involvement, and some genes have been proposed to be likely affected in this condition. And genetics are likely a very strong aspect of this condition because if we look at a patient who has an essential tremor, they have a family history of essential tremor somewhere in their family, usually a first degree relative, and the family history is present in 50% of cases. And if there is a strong family history, we can sometimes refer to this as a familial tremor. And the heritability of this condition is likely autosomal dominant, meaning that we only need one affected allele to manifest this condition. So if we have one affected parent, 50% of the children will be affected with essential tremor. So again, it's proposed that only one affected allele is required. Now, the reason that essential tremors occur is not entirely understood. It is likely that there is some issue in the brainstem, especially in the locus ceruleus. It also has been hypothesized that there is some issue or abnormal functioning of the central oscillator, which is also located in the brainstem and involves the inferior olivary nucleus. Or there has also been some hypothesis as to whether or not there's some issue with cerebellar functioning or some connection between the brainstem and the cerebellum. Perhaps there's some issue with connection between those two structures. So those are all potential hypotheses for why this condition may occur. Now let's discuss the signs and symptoms of a central tremor. We define this condition as monosymptomatic, meaning that there's only going to be a tremor. It's an isolated tremor. The tremor is considered to be slowly progressive, meaning that it can start off very mildly and over time can slowly and progressively become worse and worse. We'll talk about this in more detail in the next slide. And the central tremor is considered an action and postural tremor. So an action tremor is going to be a tremor that occurs when moving. So if you're moving your hands or your arms, the tremor is going to occur during action. And a postural tremor is going to occur when you're lifting your arms or your hands against gravity. So if you're lifting them up, you can have a tremor occur at that time as well. And we're not going to generally see a resting tremor, although it can occur in some cases as overflow. So in some cases, if there's an action or postural tremor, and then you were to put your hands down at rest, there can still be a tremor in some of those cases. This tremor is also considered a high frequency tremor that occurs at six to 12 Hertz. The amplitude, however, does vary. Because it's an action tremor, movement will often worsen the tremor. So as you're moving around, moving your arms or moving your hands, the tremor can get worse. It's going to be bilateral. There's gonna be bilateral involvement of upper extremities. So both upper extremities or both arms are going to be affected. And it's going to be either symmetric or asymmetric, meaning that if it's symmetric, the severity of tremor on both sides will be essentially equal. Or if it's asymmetric, there'll be a little less of a tremor on one side than the other. Generally speaking, it's going to be mostly symmetric or very, very minimally asymmetric. And 
other areas of the body can also be affected with a tremor. So not only the arms and the hands, but also the head, the jaw, the voice, the torso, and the legs. But the legs will occur very, very rarely. So some head tremors can be a yes-yes tremor or no-no tremor. And if there is a head tremor, it's more likely to have a voice tremor as well. So it's important to discuss a few important aspects of this particular tremor compared to other types of tremors. So for an essential tremor, there's often going to be no resting tremor, and the tremor is going to occur with action or in a postural manner when if you're holding your arms up against gravity, you can have a tremor in those cases. And because it's an action tremor, the tremor can get worse with movement. And that's going to differ compared to Parkinson's disease where there is a resting tremor in Parkinson's disease and the tremor improves with action. So that's a very important point to make note of there. We can also see no issues with reflexes in a central tremor. And we can also see no rigidity with central tremor. That's also going to be different compared to Parkinson's where we do see rigidity. And some other important points to make note of here as well is that in some cases, there can be some voluntary control of the tremor. This will be more likely to occur in more mild cases. And in those particular cases, the tremor can be suppressed by skilled manual tasks. So if there are certain manual tasks that are performed with the hands or the arms, in some cases, the tremor can be suppressed in those cases. And we can also note that the tremor can resolve during sleep. So that's also another point to make note of here as well. And again, we're going to mostly see this tremor occurring in the arms and hands, but in about 30% of cases, we can see it occurring in other parts of the body like the head and the jaw. Now we mentioned that a central tremor is going to be a slowly progressive tremor, meaning that the symptoms are going to progress and worsen over time. So symptoms are progressive. So what can often happen is when there's an onset of this condition, the tremor can begin in only one of the upper limbs. So it can occur in one hand or one arm. And over time, it can spread to the other arm. So it can affect both arms or both hands together. So again, starts usually in one side, one hand, one arm, and they can eventually start to affect the other. Initially, the tremor can be intermittent, meaning that it can only occur or only will occur during certain periods of time, especially if it's exacerbated by stress or some other exacerbating factor. But over time, the tremor can become more and more persistent and constant. And what we can also see is that initially when there's an onset of this condition, the amplitude of the tremor, the severity of the tremor is going to be mild. And over time, the severity is going to worsen. So there can be a worsening amplitude or severity over time. So eventually we can have a very severe and debilitating condition for many patients. So this can start to affect their life in many different ways, including issues with job functioning, issues with getting themselves dressed, issues with getting themselves fed. All of those essential life skills can be affected as this condition gets worse over time. Another important point to make note of as well is that there is again, only a tremor. If there are other signs and symptoms like changes in mental status, changes in personality, changes in memory, these symptoms may indicate another condition. Unless the patient is themselves getting older, they may have a concurrent diagnosis of a central tremor and dementia, for instance, if they're very, very old. But if they're younger and they have more than a tremor, this is something to think about. Perhaps it's another condition. Now, we alluded to this earlier that there are some exacerbating factors that can worsen tremors in patients. These include anxiety and stress. Hunger is also another exacerbating factor. Fatigue, so when patients are very, very tired, they can have worsened severity of tremors. Caffeine use is also another exacerbating factor that can worsen tremors. And another one is extremes in temperature. So very, very hot, very, very cold. These can also worsen the essential tremor as well. Now, there is some new research showing a connection between an essential tremor and an increased risk for dementia. So in patients who have had a diagnosis of essential tremor when they're younger, those patients appear to have a roughly three times higher risk of dementia than patients who do not have essential tremors. So this was found in a longitudinal study showing that upwards of 20% of essential tremor patients that were followed during this study developed dementia. So that's also very important to point out here. So although we don't know the underlying etiology, we don't know the exact brain structures that are affected, there does seem to be a strong relationship, at least with this new evidence, that patients with a central tremor are more likely to develop dementia as they get older than patients who do not have essential tremors. So that's a very important point to make note of as well. 
let's talk about how clinicians diagnose a central tremor. A central tremor diagnosis is going to be a clinical diagnosis, which means that we're going to look at a history and physical examination, especially if patients have a family history, this will make the diagnosis easier. The diagnosis is going to require the following, an isolated tremor, especially bilateral, mostly symmetrical and postural that affects the upper extremities with or without other areas affected, and that the tremor has occurred for at least three years. If the tremor has occurred for less than three years, it's considered indeterminate tremor. So if these other characteristics are present, but the tremor has only occurred for less than three years, we consider this an indeterminate tremor, and we wait to see if it continues, if it's at least three years, then it would be diagnosed as an essential tremor. Some other considerations include blood work. So if there's some question as perhaps there are other associated signs and symptoms with the tremor, perhaps it's not only a tremor, then it's something else to think about, some other diagnosis to think about. Or if there's no family history, this may also make the clinician think perhaps there's another diagnosis. Sometimes blood work can be used in those cases. So in those cases, we may look at TSH or thyroid simulating hormone to see if there is hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism can cause tremors. LFTs can be looked at, so liver function tests to see if patients have liver disease. Serum, ceruloplasmin can be looked at. If it's low, that indicates that a patient has Wilson's disease. This can also cause a tremor. And we can also look at creatinine to check for kidney functioning. Imaging can also be considered in some cases Imaging is especially going to be important if there's an acute onset. So all of a sudden there is very severe tremors that look like essential tremors, but it seems like it's a come on too quickly and too severely all at once. Or if there's a stepwise progression, meaning that it's come on very slowly, but there's a step by step increase in severity. Usually again, we talked about the fact that the tremor is going to slowly get worse over time. But if we see acute onset of a severe tremor or stepwise progression, this can indicate perhaps there are other conditions that may be causing the tremor. So MRI of the head or CT scan of the head can be helpful in those cases. Once the clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat it? So before we talk about treatment, it's important to point out that patients will often self-medicate with alcohol. And the reason that they do this is because alcohol can temporarily and significantly reduce tremor amplitude. Often the numbers that are quoted are a 50 to 70% reduction in tremor amplitude with alcohol. Again, it's going to be temporary. It's not going to be a treatment that clinicians are going to want their patients to be using, but patients will often use alcohol to at least temporarily suppress their tremors. Now, the staple of treatment for this condition is pharmacological treatments, which we'll discuss in a moment, but there are other conservative non-pharmacological treatments that can be used in some cases. If patients have mild essential tremor, some patients can use wrist weights, so they can have a band around their wrist that has weight, and that can help suppress the tremor as well. So some patients can use that to help control their tremor. Other conservative managements include avoiding those exacerbating factors that we talked about before, making sure that there's less stress in your life, having more sleep. All these can be very helpful for reducing the tremor severity. But if patients do require more aid, pharmacological treatments can be utilized. These include anticonvulsants like primidone. So primidone is actually going to be the hallmark treatment for this condition. Other anticonvulsants include topiramate. Topiramate can also be used to help reduce tremors. Non-selective beta blockers can also be used, including propanolol. So propanolol and primidone are going to be the two medications that you'll see with regards to treating this condition. But propanolol is mostly going to be used for intermittent cases or cases that are more mild. So if the patient has perhaps a speech or some other function that they require a suppression of the tremor, Propanolol can be used in those cases. It's often going to be taken one to one and a half hours before they need the effect. And again, it's only going to be for very temporary intermittent cases. If it's going to be a more severe case, primidone is more likely to be helpful. Other medications that can help with tremors include benzodiazepines, including clonazepam and alprazolam. These can help the tremor and also help with anxiety if anxiety is a very significant trigger for these patients. And in other cases, if medicine hasn't helped, if their tremors are refractory to medical therapy, then surgery may be employed in those cases. These types of surgeries include thalamic ventral intermediate nucleus deep brain stimulation or DBS, or another one would be focused ultrasound thalamotomy. So those are going to be some potential surgeries that can be used, again, in patients who have not had success with 
conservative management or pharmacological management, especially in very severe cases. So as patients get older, their severity can worsen. And in some cases, surgery may be utilized in those cases to help with very severe, especially arm and hand symptoms. Please check out my other neurology lessons. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.